So we have a uh, great speaker today, Dr. Peter Anderson. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of information regarding him. Dr. Peter Anderson, Professor Emeritus at San Diego State University, does research and teaches in infusion of innovation, health communication, persuasion, risk communications, and nonverbal communication. He's been recognized as one of the 100 most prolific scholars in the history of communication field. He has served as president of Western Communication Association, research director of the Japan US Telecommunication Research Institute, and editor of the Western Journal of Communication. He has been a reviewer of more than 80 professional journals. He served two terms on the executive committee of the San Diego Sierra Club, three terms of chair of the San Diego Sierra Club political committee, and as chair of Sierra Club San Diego. He's a member of the National Sierra Club Nuclear Waste Task Force. I have to admit that until I was introduced to him, I had never known that those two large towers that I've been driving by for years had absolutely no idea that that was a nuclear plant. And so I'm fascinated and delighted to have Dr. Anderson come in and present to us today. So without any further ado, the title of his topic is The Nuclear Threat at San, San Onofre and Throughout America, Problems and Solutions. Please welcome Dr. Peter Anderson. And thanks to Bart for uh, uh, hooking us up. Uh, Bart Ziegler, my friend and colleague, the uh, Coalition for Nuclear Safety, and I'm a member of that uh, body. Uh, I'm immediate past chair of Sierra Club San Diego. And as Stephen told you, I spent two years on the Sierra Club Nuclear Waste Task Force. We did a weekly hour and a half Zoom meeting for two years. So uh, I really uh, got up to speed on every nuclear issue. I co-authored a 140-page report on the problems of nuclear uh, waste in America. <clears throat> so nuclear, the nuclear industry had great promise, and it did generate a lot of electricity. But a couple of things uh, are very problematic about nuclear energy. One is there's always the risk of a catastrophic accident like we've seen at uh, Fukushima and uh, previously at Chernobyl. Uh, and an even greater and more immediate problem throughout the country and here in San Diego County is the problem of nuclear waste. And nuclear waste is... Uh, generated, of course, by the fissionable materials in a nuclear power plant. Now, fortunately, uh, San Onofre uh, is no longer generating nuclear waste because the, the uh, uh, power plant has been closed down. But now there are uh, over 80 giant 20-foot-tall canisters uh, filled with nuclear waste sitting there on the beach, of which a small fragment, uh, smaller than your fingernail, uh, could kill thousands of people. Uh, this is a real and uh, serious threat uh, to the people of Orange and San Diego County. Uh, it is, I believe, the second greatest environmental threat we face, the first being, of course, climate change, which, according to the Department of Defense, is a greater threat than China, Russia, Islamic terrorism, or anything else, destined to produce a half a billion, that's with a B, not an M, refugees in the future. So climate change is our number one problem, and I devote much of my energies now uh, fighting municipalities and states and uh, counties to try to prevent climate change. But here in San Diego, we have another real threat, and that's the waste here at San Onofre. Why is it a problem? Well, these 80-some canisters uh, sit um, high above the beach in concrete uh, concrete bunker uh, right above the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem for numerous reasons. First of all, uh, the sand surrounding their erodes. If you've ever been to Black's Beach or Del Mar, you know that sand constantly erodes. Right now we're in trouble with our Amtrak uh, line going through uh, Del Mar because it has eroded. Exactly the same thing could happen with the sand and the beach at uh, San Onofre. That could cause a catastrophic collapse of the structure that holds the nuclear waste, falling onto the beach, possibly splitting open canisters, resulting in evacuation of uh, large parts of Orange and San Diego County. So that's a real problem. 
The second problem is it sits on a major fault line. In fact, Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC uh, produced ancient maps of early America in which uh, this was called uh, Earthquake Bay. And indeed, several earthquake lines run right up the beach at San Onofre. We saw what an earthquake could do at, at Fukushima, and we could have a similar catastrophe here. Likewise, its city on the beach would be subjected to tsunamis. Again, Fukushima showed us what giant tsunamis could do to a nuclear power plant. That nuclear power plant is still red hot. In fact, this week, our group has protested the fact that Japan is dumping millions of gallons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that will eventually get here, hopefully very diluted, but nonetheless causing some potential health risks. Uh, here on the California coast. The uh, third problem with uh, the location at San Onofre is it's right by a major interstate. There's no policing of what trucks carry an interstate. You could have a Stinger missile aboard a truck, you could take out that, that uh, nuclear waste dump, uh, causing a, uh, a catastrophe that would make 9-11 look like a Sunday school picnic. Likewise, you could launch something by boat, by submarine or by conventional boat. So terrorism is a significant problem there at San Onofre. As long as that waste sits there on the beach at San Onofre, we here in San Diego County are at great risk from a nuclear catastrophe. <clears throat> now, what can we do about this? Well, the first solution is to move the waste to a central repository. There was a plan to put it at Yucca Mountain, uh, about 80 miles north of Las Vegas. Uh, but for a lot of political and uh, environmental reasons, that was put on hold. So the highest priority should be for Congress and the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to search for a permanent repository for the waste. Because while we have a big problem here at San Onofre, the problem is magnified 80 times over because there's 80 such sites around the country, some in proximity to Boston and New York City and Chicago and other huge metropolitan areas where the magnitude of the evacuation and the loss of life would be very substantial. So we need a central repository. Now there's a proposal out for what are consol called consolidated interim storage sites, one in Texas and one in New Mexico. Uh, Sierra Club opposes those because it, it, those are not uh, those those sites are not uh, geologically sound for long-term storage, and we believe that once it's moved to a consolidated interim site, that's going to be de facto a permanent site. Likewise, there's major problems with transporting nuclear waste. Our shaky rail system. Um, provides a huge problem. If you move this stuff at all, you got to move it once, not multiple times shuttling the stuff around the country. There's also a major problem with security. Do you allow uh, information to go out on the fact that a nuclear waste shipment is being shipped? If you do, everybody knows about it, including mischief makers and terrorists. If you don't announce it, then there's no uh, local first response force uh, available to uh, intervene in the case of a derailment or a leak or uh, some other uh, disaster. So shipping this is very tough. What we need is a very sound rail line, one way to a nuclear waste site in a geologically safe area, and that should be our highest priority. Now, this is not going to probably happen in my lifetime or yours. We hope it would, but I wouldn't hold my breath. So what can we do in the interim? Well, Bart and I have been working very hard on a couple of important things that we can do locally. The first is we have contact the federal and the local better right now, it would be a long time after the leak occurred that we'd know that there was a leak at San Onofre because essentially they've got about eight Geiger counters arrayed around there until the radiation built up to a very significant level, uh, we wouldn't have an early warning. Uh, we've enlisted the help of the dean of, a uh, former dean of the College of Science at UCSD, Mark Tiemens, um, who has a system of detecting very low levels of nuclear 
uh, 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 signals. In fact, he was the first person in the entire United States to detect a signal of the radioactive leak at Fukushima all the way across the Pacific here in California. His system would only cost a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It's already in place. This would just fund people to go to the Air Pollution Control District, uh, pick up the data, and report it uh, back to UCSD, where his lab is. Um, we've had a lot of trouble getting this uh, approved. We're still hopeful that uh, Tara Lawson Reamer, your county supervisor, and Nathan Fletcher, who have both shown interest in this, will get this in the budget either this year or next year and that we'll have better monitoring, which will give us a very early warning so that we can go in and patch up a problem should a leak in one of these 80 canisters occur. The other thing we're uh, trying to work on very, very seriously, and, uh, and this is, a, is a extremely important, is to uh, establish uh, a, a real system for transferring nuclear waste to a safer canister should a crack occur in one of the existing casks. Uh, that's sometimes called a dry storage facility or a hot cell. They're very expensive, but the expense is trivial compared to uh, the potential trillions of dollars that would be involved in an evacuation of this area. A uh, hot cell uh, enables you to take a canister that has a crack or is compromised in some fashion, move it into the secure building, and move it into a more secure canister. So this is another thing we're working on. We tried to get um, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Edison, who has not been a great friend of ours, to uh, keep the uh, cooling ponds at San Onofre. Uh, they did not want to do this, and unfortunately the Coastal Commission sided with them, although the Coastal Commission says, we're going to hold our nose and we're going to vote with Commonwealth Edison. We'd wish we they had held their votes and supported uh, keeping the cooling pools, because the cooling pools, like a dry storage facility, would be a safe site uh, to transfer uh, a leaking canister uh, were this to occur. So this is an ongoing problem. There's a big solution, and that's a, a, a eventual central waste storage facility or two somewhere in America where all of this waste from all the sites around the country can be transferred to. In the short term, we believe that uh, better monitoring and we have the system in place to do that and or uh, the building of a hot cell. So we, we continue to work on this. I now serve on uh, Congressman Levin's uh, Nuclear Waste Task Force and Bart and I are both very involved in bi-weekly meetings with the coalition we established called the Coalition for Nuclear Safety. And uh, we would welcome you to uh, join that coalition. Uh, we have a few dozen active members in South Orange County and San Diego County that are continuing to uh, uh, work on <clears throat> meaningful solutions. The, the chance of something bad occurring in any given year is low. But if you accumulate those risks across numerous years, probably dozens of years, the risk is considerably higher. Something will go wrong at that site eventually. And having nuclear waste stored on a beach on an earthquake zone near a tsunami, near a freeway, and near an ocean with potential terrorists is one of the more stupid things that I can conceive of. So. Uh, those are my remarks. Uh, I wanted to leave a lot of time for uh, Q&A, and we do have apparently about 10 minutes, and I'm happy to address any of your questions. Yes, sir. Well, that's a great question. He wants to know who has a final say. First, first of all, we, we almost never know who's really in charge of the nuclear waste. Is it the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Is it the Department of Energy? Is it the Department of Transportation? So we're not even always sure what the lines of authority are right now. But if a permanent repository is established, uh, there, uh, there is a, a move to have informed consent of the local authority. Now, I think informed consent is a sticky issue because how many of us ever consented 
uh, to have this waste located at CN and Ofre to begin with. There was no consent process associated with it. Uh, the federal government approved these sites. Uh, they built uh, San Onofre, they're built by private companies, and there was no consent. Um, so ultimately, I think the authority is in Congress, and whether they uh, listen to the local people, whether they be Indian tribes or counties or states or whatever, I think is still an open issue. I hope we do consult with them. There are some communities, I think, that are impoverished and really would like the jobs. And if, as I believe is possible, uh, we could have a repository that is extremely safe. France is building one. Finland is building one. I think we in the United States certainly have the uh, know-how and technology to build one. Once it's a very safe site, I don't think it would represent a great risk to a local community, unlike the very risky site here in Southern California where the nuclear waste is presently located. Thank you. Yes, sir. What other countries, you know what other countries, there, there are a lot of other countries that have quite a bit of people in the world. France is a good one example. Yep. What do they do? Sure. Well, I think the best example is probably Finland that just bought uh, a nuclear uh, site off the uh, coast on a big island right off of Finland that is uh, found a secure site. Uh, two miles uh, uh, below sea level, uh, which has no water intrusion. It apparently is a dry uh, 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 geological uh, formation. And they're gonna put all their nuclear waste down there. I think France has had some uh, ingenious solutions with uh, building uh, deep uh, underground repositories because this stuff has to stay there for 100,000 years. I mean, this stuff, the half-life of some of these fissionable materials is 10, 20, 30,000 years. So we're not talking about our grandchildren. We're talking about generations uh, that would go back to uh, the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons if we were looking backward in history. So this is a, 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 a this site has to be a secure site or sites uh, that contain it. Um, the solutions around the world range from totally stupid to uh, relatively uh, ingenious. And I would look to France and Finland as maybe the best two uh, examples of that. Canada apparently is working on a good central uh, nuclear waste repository. The stupid things are things you see, uh, sadly, right now in the Ukraine, in which Russian soldiers literally attacked the Chernobyl site, probably got exposed to lots of radiation because that's an exclusion zone. And uh, you have also had... Uh, wars raging around several active uh, sites. Uh, so that is really out of control and could contaminate uh, a lot of Europe if the wrong thing happened. Uh, now, some people wonder, you know, in an energy short situation, what can we do? Well, nuclear, wa nuclear power may be with us in the very short term, but I hope it's in the very short term because we got to get off. We got to get off our addiction to this very dangerous uh, solution. Instead, we have to have a massive national renewal program, un not unlike we had in World War II, not only to protect the global ecosystem from climate change, which is a huge problem here. I mean, Del Mar and Imperial Beach and Mission Valley will be evacuated by the uh, end of the next century uh, with a two meter rise in sea level from climate change. So this is a real pressing problem. We also have to figure out ways to replace the energy we're already getting from nuclear waste, uh, from nuclear power. Uh, and uh, uh, what we can do, of course, is have a very aggressive uh, solar programs. We're already well underway. Some days at noon, California generates 100% of its power with renewables. That's impressive, but we can do better. We need better battery storage to store this overnight so we can draw on this power we store during the day. We need increasing wind power. I favor windmills off our coast, windmills in the mountains and deserts, although there is some environmental opposition to it. I think you gotta think of the big picture here. And we gotta generate as much wind power as we can. We have a great possibility of generating even more geothermal power. There's three ge geothermal plants off in the Imperial Valley right now on, on the shores of the of uh, the Sea of Cortez. And there's more interest in generating geothermal power there. And that has the additional benefit of producing lithium. Uh, we have a fantastic opportunity to be 
not the Silicon Valley, but the lithium Valley of the world. And this lithium is generated in the most environmentally sensitive way because it's available in the wastewater of the, uh, of the, of the plant that generates uh, geothermal energy. As you know, we're going to have to have massive amounts of lithium. Now much of it comes from China. That may be untenable in the future. Their supply is even short. Uh, we need to produce a huge domestic reserve of lithium because everything everything from our, our, our smart smartphones to our uh, next generation of electric cars are going uh, to rely mostly on lithium batteries, although there's a couple other uh, potential battery solutions in the works. So... Uh, we have to do uh, wind, we have to do solar, we have to do geothermal, and, uh, and we, can, we can work our way out of this. And we have to start this immediately because oil is a precarious uh, uh, fuel. Uh, first of all, we, we can see what a, a disruption in the Middle East or in Russia and Ukraine can do to the world's energy supply. It's just not a reliable source of power and we're foolish to continue to run our vehicles on an unreliable and environmentally dangerous source that is oil. Uh, we're like heroin addicts and we need to get unhooked uh, from this very dangerous uh, fuel and uh, nuclear energy, as we've talked about this morning, is not a good alternative. So massive renewable programs. We need to invest huge amounts in the public sector and the private sector here in California and around the country uh, to generate power safely. Yes, sir. It has. Well, they're decommissioning the whole plant. Uh, Bart, do you know when the power lines are coming down? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, the power lines will be used in the future because the power grids could be having some wind on the top side of the ocean. Have solar, solar systems in the hills. They, that power, their power lines would be a wonderful way to keep transmit. But what's happening now is is not centralized power, but distributed power. I think Bob Ramson talked about distributed power. Yes. Uh, Bart is the founder of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation, a totally wonderful organization working on a number of, of issues with uh, poverty and uh, nuclear waste. And, and uh, also, uh, like me, a member of our coalition on nuclear safety. Uh, I saw our signal that our time is nearing an end, but I've got probably time for a couple more questions. Bart, go for it. And Bart and I can both hang around for a few minutes if you want to talk to us one on one, but I'll, I'll take one or two more. General, yes, sir. Yeah, that's exactly right. The Salton Sea, Sea of Cortez, same, same thing. Yeah, that is uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, marine species and such. So uh, I'm not in favor of that. But th this is a treasure trove of lithium out in the Salton Sea. And we uh, ought to approve that as, as quickly as possible. I think the, uh, the measures are in the works to do that. There's also, my, my wife was dean of the Imperial Valley campus of San Diego State University. And I've been out there to ceremonies and graduations. They have a 20% unemployment rate. Uh, almost every student out there at that ranch campus of San Diego State is a first generation college student. The fact that we could bring a relatively clean and vitally important national resource to the Imperial Valley uh, would be a win-win, I think, for everybody. Got time for one more? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Any others? Oh, yes, please. Um, when San Onofre was performing at its peak, output of energy, how much energy was that? Are we already past that with what we're producing for renewables that you recommended? Do we need to fill out that infrastructure to even hit what it was hitting at its peak? Where do we stand? Well, uh, San Onofre was generating, I think, 10% of the power for California when it was at its peak. But we've more than replaced that re with renewables already. Uh, the main problem with renewables right now is storage. And so we need batteries and maybe what are called pump storage facilities where you have two uh, lakes 
And during the day when you have a surplus of power, you pump water from the lower lake into the upper lake. And uh, at night when you're, especially between four o'clock and nine o'clock, don't do your dishes during those times if you can help it. Uh, during that period when we're at peak power demand, uh, the water flows down through a generator generating electric power. It can, that, those systems operate about a, a three to four ratio. So you're spending about four units of electricity when it's at its peak to generate three units of electricity going downhill during night. We need more batteries. We need distributed storage in our homes with things like uh, uh, Tesla batteries in our, in our homes to store. Uh, we need, of course, more uh, solar in our backyards and roofs. And then we uh, need some centralized uh, uh, battery storage facilities at, uh, in, in private uh, companies. Uh, I'm also on the advisory board for the new San Diego Community Power Authority, which will replace SDG&E as your new source for power. And you will have a choice. You can go back to SDG&E, which is 70% dirty power and only 30% clean power, or you, can, you will be automatically defaulted to uh, a 50-50, 50% renewables with new uh, San Diego Community Power uh, uh, Corporation. Um, and Or you can go, as I'm going to go, for 100% at only about 5% increase in cost, you can do 100% renewables. Uh, so this is the way of the future. I was just at the Padre game last Wednesday uh, when the president of the uh, San Diego Community Power Association announced that the Padres are the first major league baseball team to now operate on 100% renewable energy. First major league baseball team. So when you see those bright lights go on and you can see uh, Machado hit a home run and the, the scoreboard lights up, it's all renewable it's all renewable energy, 100%. So what's that? It, it's already happened. Oh, the consumer, it's, gonna, it's rolling out in Encinitas and then San Diego and then the county and then Chula Vista. They have a, what's called a joint power authority in which uh, uh, a series of local governments uh, have joined together. There's two of these. There's also one in North County, which I believe is Carlsbad, uh, Solana Beach and Del Mar, uh, they formed their own joint power authority and they have a different company that's going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, but the big one that's going to have both the county and the city of San Diego, Chula Vista, La Mesa, Encinitas, they're all going to be in the, uh, in the, in the authority that I'm on the advisory committee for. And, uh, they are rolling this out this year and next year by 2024, everybody will have an opportunity to go off sdg and &E. and only three percent of customers are operating to go back to your very friendly ecologically sensitive power company sdg and &E. uh, most people really don't want any part of that now sdg and &E will still send you the bill but the money will come to the power authority and they'll still transmit it uh, sdg and &E is basically getting out of the power generation and procurement business uh, they're going to become a transmission company so they will maintain lines and they'll, they'll uh, but this is a great opportunity and talk about a way to reduce uh, uh, carbon and greenhouse gas. I mean, this is fabulous. We're, uh, you know, the Padres and the airport has just announced they're gonna be 100% renewable energy. So they're only buying energy off the grid that is, uh, is produced with geothermal, solar or um, wind. So very exciting time. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, donations being made in your name to the Urban Street Angels, which is a homeless shelter for youth downtown. Yeah, I have to tell you all that Steph Zeeman has done a wonderful job with speakers, and I haven't asked him for anything except to hear you speak. You, you were, uh, we had one opening at the end of this, this month to, today, and he had someone else lined up and I said, Steve, really, I would really like to hear Dr. Peterson, would you please, Dr. Anderson, would you please get him here? So thank you, thank you, thank you from all of us. And thank you for all that you do. Uh, I have spoken previous times to Rotary. I was a consultant to 
their uh, national international uh, organization back on uh, how to reach uh, distant cultures. And so I've worked with Rotary the past. You do great work. Uh, and uh, uh, we know uh, what it takes to be in uh, a purely voluntary organization because that's what Bart and I do. So we know what you do and, and we appreciate it.